Well, good morning, folks. Um, next slide, Henry. This is the uh, Fatty Liver Foundation uh, Liver Webinar Series. We'd like to welcome everybody here, the, for the folks that uh, have been here before. Uh, this is um, a continuation of our, where we're following the major conferences and talking about uh, the state of the art and the new things that are coming with uh, liver disease. This is really important to me uh, because um, the reason I'm involved with all this is I'm very serious about saving my life. Uh, when I was diagnosed with cirrhosis and the doctor said, I'm sorry, we have no treatment, I freaked out a little bit and uh, I, I struggled with that and, and we still have no treatment. But you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a kind of the poster boy for this field because I'm a successful cirrhosis patient. And I'll tell you a little about that, but I'm going to need drugs. I, you know, I will need therapy and the conferences and the researchers and the scientists that we're um, interviewing and all of their colleagues are working on things that I count on to save my life. And I, I, we want to share that with all of you. So next slide. I feel kind of odd when I do this because, you know, it's, the lawyers make us say things like this. But, you know, we're going to be talking about things that may be, you know, state of the art, not in the public um, public domain really, uh, those things that uh, will become the therapies that save our lives. And it's important that as patients, you don't um, assume that, that uh, we're offering any medical advice here. This is uh, information no doctor-patient relationships are created by any of the uh, discussions by our panelists. And uh, if we happen to use terms that aren't part of the uh, published uh, or available therapies, um, it's, it's, it's just information. And we want you to take this information and learn from it and use it, but talk to your doctor about it. So that's really important. So next slide. <clears throat> I'm part of this community. If you look at that slide, it's really scary of what's coming at us as a society. If you have two friends, one of you has a fatty liver, you know, and I was one of those guys. Um, I was a, I was what they call a fast progressor. I moved from an F2 in 2010 to an F4 cirrhosis in 2015. So, you know, I'm, I'm a person that uh, is, is at high risk for uh, dying of this darn thing. And that's what uh, motivates me to uh, be engaged with this. So next slide. Most of you will not have seen your biopsy slide. This is mine. Um, it's kind of a, uh, <laughs> you know, this is kind of my baby picture. All that blue stuff is fibrosis, and that's that's what's actually happening in your liver when you uh, when you have this disease. Is that scar tissue forms, and it eventually uh, will kill the liver if you don't do something about it. So next slide. This is my personal journey. <clears throat> when I started, one of the measures that we use uh, is FibroScan. And doctors will consider 11 or 12 as a threshold for uh, cirrhosis frequently. My measurement at diagnosis was 21.5. So <clears throat> you can imagine that was pretty scary. Um, but over the next year and a half, after getting good advice and having a really good uh, partner to 
to keep me on the path, I'd lost 30% of my weight. And today my fiber scan measure is 9.6, which puts me in an F3 kind of uh, category. So I'm an example of the fact that diet and lifestyle change can be really effective, but I know that I am going to need therapy and I'm counting on uh, these doctors to bring that to me. So next slide. One of the things that <clears throat> I, uh, I want people to understand is, is that if you have liver disease, you are, and, and the other uh, metabolic syndrome parts, you're at a much higher risk of, capture, of things like COVID-19. Uh, this was a recent study which uh, looked at 61 million records and, and tracked uh, the numbers of people who caught COVID. And you know this doesn't address the people that died or the people that had really serious problems, but it talks about uh, how susceptible a person is who has these comorbid comorbidities. And so if, you, uh, if you're part of our, our NASH or fatty liver community, you really want to be sensitive to your risk. So next slide. So the mission of the foundation, <laughs> our goal is to improve things for the patients. We want to improve diagnosis, treatment, the support of everybody that uh, has these things because NASH is not well understood. People don't know about it. Uh, it's generally um, minimized in discussions uh, in early stages. So next slide. The Fatty Liver Foundation is the only national voice whose goal is to deal with patients on the ground. Um, there are a lot of people who are providing uh, information, websites, how-tos, counsel. There's a lot of material the really, really hard thing to do is to go out in the mud and the blood where patients actually live and to try to help them with their problems. And that's, that's our fundamental goal. Right now, because of COVID, we're, uh, we're locked in our rooms like everybody else, but the uh, mission of the religion is to help the patients uh, in their lives, where they live, and not just talk to them uh, from on high with a website. So next slide. Uh, Henry, can you do the next slide? <clears throat> so when we, when we designed the uh, Fatty Liver Foundation, there are basic four areas that we feel that we can have some impact. Uh, we of course do public communications where we speak to the powers that be about things that would be better. Um, we're a patient advocate in that sense. We talk about lifestyle and diet and the way you manage this. Our major function is to promote screening of asymptomatic undiagnosed liver disease. And to that end, we've sponsored a SUN study. We've actually gone out uh, and done screening for people that uh, were at risk, but were not diagnosed or known to be, uh, who did not have uh, an active disease that they knew about. Next slide. Uh, Henry? So <laughs> that's, my, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. 
But at this point, I'd like to introduce you to our chief medical officer. This is uh, Dr. Niraj Mystery, and I am just so pleased that uh, Dr. Mystery is a part of our because he brings with him uh, a background that is tremendously valuable to uh, the issue of with public health problems. And that's what we have here. Non-communicable diseases are gigantic public health things. Um, he's uh, had a lot of experience in uh, the public health arena. He was the managing director of the Global National Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases, the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Uh, he was a... <clears throat> uh, founder and uh, director of the global business uh, community. He's done a lot of work with uh, HIV and malaria, AIDS, and various uh, major problems uh, throughout Africa and studied, studied in uh, Europe. Um, he's, he's just so too darn educated. I'm surprised we're able to get him to come here. But he's also now a prof at uh, Georgetown. And we're just delighted to have him as part of our organization. I'd like to turn the program over to him now. Wayne, thank you so much. And, you know, no matter how many times I hear your story, I'm just always so inspired by it. Um, and, uh, and thank you for the leadership that you have shown in, in setting up the Fatty Liver Foundation. And, you know, together with Henry and Gabriella and the support of Rosemary, we, we're quite excited now to build this as an institution and create a movement on fatty liver disease and uh, particularly from the ground up, uh, bringing in the patient voice to this response. Um, you know, there's an interesting shift in the world uh, that we're seeing um, uh, mainly in parts of middle and low income countries. Uh, and that is what we call an epidemiological transition. So it's mainly from infectious diseases to non-communicable diseases, diseases related to diet and lifestyle. And the forerunner for these diseases have been the industrialized countries uh, or the wealthier countries, the United States and Western Europe. So whatever we do here on fatty liver disease is going to have implications for the entire world, given that this is the type and trend of disease uh, shift that we're seeing all over the world now. Um, and so that's why this is a critical time. Uh, Henry, next slide, please. Um, so this slide, uh, which looks quite ominous and rightfully so, talks about the gathering storm of Nash. And, and firstly, when, and, and we can follow this sort of uh, spiral from the outside moving in, uh, the health systems that we have were generally focused on the medical response uh, to any particular disease. And we know with Nash, as with many other diseases, but with Nash particularly, it requires a multidisciplinary effort. And we have to address issues of lifestyle uh, together with diet, uh, uh, food access, uh, patient education, in addition to having appropriate screening and treatment. And so uh, the health systems that we have haven't been prepared to actually address issues in such a holistic multidisciplinary way. Further to that, as we mount a response against this uh, uh, global crisis of NASH, we don't have medicines for it. And, and when we look at diseases like HIV in the past, uh, you know, we were mounting a response to uh, an epidemic where we didn't have any effective therapeutic. And this is where we are with NASH. And hopefully we have some promising um, candidates in the pipeline. And, and, you know, the, the saying that still holds is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And if we do not address the issue at the preventative stage and, and uh, uh, the severity of disease progresses, the costs are going to add up. And certainly the costs of liver transplantation or advanced management uh, in facility-based care is going to incur a huge cost. Um, and as, as far as being the 21st century's looming public health threat, 
it's almost a perfect storm, a confluence of several factors when we look at things like the diabetes epidemic, obesity on the rise, metabolic syndrome. And these are all risk factors that converge on the liver, literally, uh, that is resulting in NASH. Uh, so we have our work cut out for us in terms of public health and how we scale up the response uh, to NASH. And so this is what we're looking at as, as a, the public health implications. Uh, Henry, the next slide, please. So um, we, we do feel we are at the tip of the iceberg when it actually comes to NASH. So we estimate there to be about 180,000 patients that are diagnosed, and yet that is just a really small representation of the estimated 100 million patients we think uh, that are living with, uh, with NASH. Uh, I think two weeks ago, it was the um, uh, state of obesity report that came out that talked about an adult obesity rate of 42.6% in the United States. And those are certainly the risk factors that we're looking at. Um, I think parallel to the fact that there are many cases that are undiagnosed is also the fact that those cases that are diagnosed are the pool from which we draw uh, uh, patients for clinical trials. And that number is currently at about 3,000. And so if we want to actually run large scale trials for new therapeutics, we're going to have to diagnose many more patients. Um, and so uh, our work is certainly cut out for us. Um, and that's what inspired the Sun One study. Henry, next slide, please. So, um, you know, diagnosing NASH was very much uh, in the realm of work for hepatologists, a very specialized part of medicine. And it wasn't even the general practitioners or primary care physicians that were bringing up this conversation uh, with patients. And, you know, with quite a few doctors we spoke to, primary care physicians, well, why should I even talk about that when we don't have anything that we can do about it? Um, and we know certainly that there's a lot that we can do from a lifestyle, a lifestyle perspective, uh, but it's about having those tools and access to these screening procedures. And this is what the Sun One study did. Literally, we had uh, patients, uh, um, uh, we had people going out into communities uh, recruiting patients for screening uh, using the fiber scan machine. And with that, we found many people, uh, particularly in high risk groups, uh, that self selected to be screened. Um, and so that told us that there was certainly a demand side uh, for, for people understanding their risk factors and their state of uh, well being when it came to, to their liver functions. To that end, we are now uh, going to the SUN2 study where we intend to screen 20,000 patients. SUN1 screened 1,000 patients. Uh, so we wanna replicate that model and with uh, new technologies for screening and diagnosis and staging, we're quite uh, excited to see how we can integrate this into the study. So certainly watch this space. Um, so, um, we're delighted to have uh, our expert panelists today, uh, but before we get into the panel itself, Henry, do you want to pull up a poll? We just want to get a, a, a sense of the distribution of attendees today. Okay, so are you a patient? Yes or no? Okay, so if you respond to that, then we can go on to our, our panel. Okay, so this is uh, going to be the mainstay of the way we address NASH uh, in this particular triad uh, of lifestyle, testing, and treatment. And I think uh, just a, a simple observation uh, from, um, uh, uh, from, from health and our approaches to addressing health issues is we're always in search of that magic bullet, silver bullet, single issue uh, response intervention or cure. And if anything we know about NASH, it has to be uh, a multifaceted response. We have to have lifestyle and dietary interventions. We have to have treatment and testing is the critical nexus between the two. Um, so, uh, so with that, let's go to um, uh, our first panelists. We have a, a slight uh, shift in the, uh, in the order. Uh, we're waiting for Dr. Danani. So I'm gonna go to Dr. Sanya um, and I'm catching him while he's uh, in the middle of a chew. So I'll, I'll do a little introduction uh, to let you get ready. 
So uh, Dr. Arun S uh, Sanyal is the professor of medicine uh, in the gastroenterology division at uh, Virginia Con Commonwealth University School of Medicine. He's also the co-organizer of the Paris Snatch meeting, uh, which is uh, what we are on the heels of uh, with this particular panel discussion. And he's gonna be discussing testing approaches uh, and some of the, the recent developments with testing. So uh, welcome Dr. Sanyal, over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, so, um, uh, oh, slides. Okay. There we go. Uh, so, um, Thank you again, uh, Wayne. Uh, thank you for uh, providing this podium. And, you know, I think uh, Neeraj rightfully pointed out that there are a lot of people out there who have uh, NASH. We just don't know it. And one of the biggest barriers to access to care is the need for a biopsy. Not only is it invasive, it carries certain risks. And so, Let's try to see, you know, how we can navigate around that. Can I go to the next slide, please? So here are my disclosures, moving on. So uh, these are some of the common issues in identifying uh, fatty liver disease in the clinical setting. Uh, it is often incidental and our current approach is largely biopsy driven. Next. So if we now look at what the current state of the art actually is, uh, this slide is actually extracted from the current AASLT practice guideline. And what I'll try to show is that this practice guideline is a little bit ivory tower and out of touch with reality. And what we'll try to do is try to find something that actually can work all around the country and in every clinic. So the first step in the patient's journey is someone who is at risk. That is the obese individual who may be genetically at risk. We have no guidance on those. Now, if you suspect somebody has fatty liver disease, we say you do a biopsy and we are particularly looking at whether they have steatohepatitis or they have advanced fibrosis and that's the population we target for therapeutics because that's what determines prognosis. And then once you start treatment, uh, we don't yet have approved therapies, but the general implication is that you assess response to treatment histologically. So let's go through this step-by-step step and see where it falls apart and what can we do to put it back together. Next. So there are things that we are looking for in uh, a liver biopsy that uh, I think uh, set the foundation for why we have a histology-based anchor. First of all, histology is used to look for NASH, uh, which involves presence of steatosis, hepatocellular ballooning and fibrosis. And then you also look for us uh, and lobular inflammation. So here are the kind of things. So the Two things the biopsy tells you if somebody has NASH and what is the fibrosis stage. Next slide, please. And so essentially the reason to do a biopsy is because it tells us if fatty liver disease is present, it can give us some information about competing etiologies. It gives us primarily prognostic information. That's really the key piece that allows us to decide which patient needs drug therapy. It actually doesn't tell us which target is going to be most relevant for the patient. It doesn't give us any idea which drug would be the best one for that individual patient based on underlying biology at least. And uh, it of course uh, is sensitive to change and gives us an idea of whether it's improving over time. So all of the things that are in the yes box actually inform why the practice guidelines are written the way they are. Next. But the problem is this, that biopsies are invasive, painful. They can actually cause even mortality. So a very large study actually showed 
uh, there is about a one in 1,000 risk of a significant bleed and one in 10,000 risk of even mortality from a liver biopsy for chronic liver diseases. Now, if you're cirrhotic, have more advanced fibrosis, that risk is higher. So regardless, you should never have mortality from a diagnostic procedure. That's just, you know, it flies. In. The first principle of medicine is do no harm. It violates the very first principle of medicine. And if you just want to do simple math, if in a world that everybody follows the practice guideline and you take the 100, the 30% of our population that is fat in their liver and you biopsy everybody, you'd have 100,000 life-threatening bleeds and 10,000 deaths. That is just think of how many jumbo jets full of people that would be, you know, to use the jumbo jet analogy, how many plane loads of people would go down in flames just from a diagnostic procedure. So this is just untenable as a public health measure. It's that simple. There's really, there's not even a debatable issue. Next slide. So what information that we get from a biopsy can we get non-invasively? So if you look, we've made a lot of progress in non-invasive tools to not only see if there's excess fat, but to actually quantify the fat. So on the right, you can see that with a fibro scan, which is widely available, the CAP score has a positive predictive value of separating those who have no fat versus those who have pathological amounts of fat with a positive predictive value of 0.96. And these are data from the National Clinical Research Network. This is not biased data from some you know, company which has a conflict of interest. On the left, you see the MRI PDFF, and you can see again a fairly tight correlation with histological assessment. So we can tell you non-invasively if you've got excess fat in the liver. Next. Also remember that if you're obese and you're diabetic and you have hypertension, your risk of having fat, excess fat in your liver pre-test without doing any test is in the 70, 75% range. So if I didn't do any test, I'd be right three out of four times. So Telling someone, figuring out someone has excess fat in their liver is actually very simple for the most part. The bigger question is, do you have NASH? And particularly, do you have the kind of NASH that needs drug therapy, which means do you have a lot of activity? Are you scarring down your liver? And we've come up with this phenotype. We call this at-risk NASH in the biomarker development space. And the at-risk NASH means you got NASH, you got activity score of four or higher, and your fibrosis stage two or higher, that identifies that population whose mortality risk is increased due to the NASH. And this is a, the emerging technologies. This is a test uh, called NIS4, which includes the microRNA34, alpha-2 macroglobin, YKL, and hemoglobin A1C. When you combine these, there's an algorithm. As you can see in three different uh, cohorts, you're getting ORUCs of 0.8 and a diagnostic accuracy between 70 and 80% which is not bad at all for a, a non-invasive tool. And so I think these are all coming. This paper's already published in Lancet this year, Lancet Gastro. So more data is coming with this. So tools are coming to not only identify if you have fat, but actually if you have the kind of fat that needs drug treatment. Next. So here are the different tests and, you know, uh, they're all being developed. So this is a very active space, but probably in the next few years, many of these will be mature enough to be applicable in a real world setting. Next slide. And similarly, you know, uh, uh, there are other tests looking at disease monitoring tools, whether they are changing over time. And once again, some of these are uh, available. The ELF test is being actively looked at. ProC3 is being actively looked at. Uh, but uh, it, there's a very high probability that several of these will be commercially available within the next three to four years. So I think the field is, some are already available, some are going to be available. So the field is already moving in that direction. Next slide. So some years ago, I was asked to write a review by Nature uh, Gastro and I was told, uh, write a way to risk stratify that physicians in community can actually use because the practice guidelines are useless. So as one of the authors of the practice guideline, after simmering for a while, 
you know, being upset that my guideline that I had contributed to was considered useless. I started thinking about it, and it, that's when it really dawned on me that you know, in the academic world, we want to be these purists, and we want to do everything purely and precisely, and we've made perfect the enemy of the good. And so uh, I told them that look, we don't have any evidence based to create such a thing. They said, just make what what do you do in your practice? Write it out. So that's what we did. So we put people in a green bucket, which is a good risk bucket, high risk bucket, and an intermediate risk bucket based on some common sense things, things are clinical gestalt, and also the data at the time about FIB4 and some of these markers and fibrosis stage. And so this had never actually been prospectively validated. Next slide. So uh, we have now actually prospectively evaluated a FIB4 based uh, approach to in a prospective cohort of 2,500 patients in a real world setting called the target study, followed them out median duration three years and actually can show that based on something as simple as a FIB4 alone, which is based on a CBC and a hepatic panel, you really don't need anything else. You can actually predict prognosis, actual outcomes, as well as biopsy. So we now have non-invasive tools that can tell you if you have fat, we have non-invasive tools that are developing that can tell you if you have the kind of NASH that needs to be treated. Now we have tools that can predict your prognosis. And we've already shown that there, at least proof of concept that some of these can move with treatment. So certainly in terms of getting access to care, which is the first step, there are already a number of tools which are pretty close to being ready for application. So I'm going to stop there and, you know, this is so near and dear to me. I could go on and on and on all afternoon, but I don't want to, you know, bore you with my rambling on. So I'm going to stop here and see if they're, you know, I'll pass the baton back to Neeraj. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunyal. And, and certainly you uh, distill that information to make it very accessible to our patient audiences. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, from, from a, a physician point of view, uh, we always held the thing that seeing is believing. So when we did a biopsy, we actually saw the tissue and, and, uh, and now we have a calculation and a formula that tells us something. Um, and when we plot that on a graph and patients see their result on a curve, um, uh, the impact has been huge. Um, and we saw that with the fibro scan results uh, Absolutely. That the patient. So, you know, we ha also have this data set that we took from uh, uh, our electronic medical record system mm -hmm. and uh, lo looking at centers all around the country that use the same EMR. Mm -hmm. And we looked at people who are coming for a wellness visit, not known to have any liver disease, just coming for a wellness visit and who happen to have a hepatic panel drawn as part of their wellness, a comprehensive metabolic panel or a hepatic panel drawn in the context of that wellness visit and on whom we had at least one year of follow-up data. And we followed those patients up to five or seven, five years. What we found is if you're over the age of 40 and your FIB4 is over, so we found that about 1% of the population had a FIB4 over 2.67. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're over the age of 40 and your FIB4 is over 2.67, you have a 20% probability of having a liver event, one in five within the next five years, within the next three years. So this is a population of people coming for wellness visit. We are not talking about sick liver patients. Right. So it just, because the other thing we found is of the people who developed events during that time frame, the majority of them, two out of three, the event was the first time their liver disease was diagnosed. Um, uh, that's really interesting information. And I think from a patient perspective, what we say is that even if you on that trajectory for a risk of, of some sort of liver event, we can reverse that with immediate lifestyle changes. And that's the importance of knowing. Absolutely. Um, uh, just one more question from, from a patient perspective as well. When we use tests, we use tests for diagnosis. Uh, or screening, and then we use tests for monitoring. And can you speak to that on if a patient has risk for disease, 
what sort of tests they can uh, talk to their primary care physician about, uh, and if they have been confirmed with NASH or, or, or fatty liver disease, what sort of tests they can use to see if their lifestyle changes are making uh, improvements in the right direction. So the simplest thing to do, is, and you know, in an ideal world, would be to find access to someone who has a fibro scan because that can give you direct confirmation of whether you have significant fat in the liver and whether you have, whether your liver is beginning to stiffen up. Uh, this along with a Fib4 gives you a pretty good profile of what you need to know from a fatty liver disease perspective. It's important to point out that having abnormal liver enzymes doesn't automatically translate into non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You can have hep C, you can have hep B, so it's very important for patients and their providers to be cognizant that there are other things that make your liver enzymes go up and, and that those, because they have very specific treatments, those should, those should be screened for and ruled out before we go start going down the NASH journey. And you can frequently have more than one thing going on at the same time. So the CAP and the FIB4 and the liver stiffness are the simple measures that not only tell you whether you have the disease, but what your prognosis is. Once you start treatment, uh, you know, some of the things you can follow is whether your liver enzymes normalize or decrease, if your weight improves, because if you're engaging in proper lifestyle intervention, you should see some improvement in those parameters. And then over time, uh, your liver stiffness should get better. We will show some data at ASLD from the STELLAR and the Simtuzumab trial. So 1,000 patients with advanced fibrosis, showing that uh, those whose liver stiffness improved, their actually mortality and outcome risk decreased dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. So, um, so I think that's a good segue to, to go into um, uh, some of the, the treatment advances and the state of treatment uh, and therapeutics. Uh, for liver disease. So I uh, have the pleasure of um, uh, introducing Dr. Manal uh, Abdel Malik. Uh, she's the professor of medicine and the director of the NAFLD Clinical Research Program at Duke University. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Abdel Man uh, Malik. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Wayne and the Program organizers, Dr. Mystery, I, I've been in this space a long time, as I know many of my colleagues have been also. And, and while I, I enjoy uh, the science and the studies and the research, there's really nothing that gives us more fulfillment in doing what we do uh, than, than connecting with our patients. And, and, and we do this because of our patients. So I'm just absolutely uh, delighted to be here uh, today. Um, can I get the slides up, please? Henry? Oh, I think it froze. He's just going to reload it. There we go. So, um, you know, when we talk about the treatment, do I have control over the, uh... okay. So when, when we talk about the current treatment of fatty liver disease, I, I think we can think about it in three categories. Um, the foundation of treatment is really all about lifestyle and weight modification. Um, so we can think about the foundation of care being one that addresses obesity control and, and doing so in, in whatever manner works for our patients. Um, for some, it's, it's, it's regular exercise as, as, as much as can be accomplished, modification of diet. For others, it may be consideration of anti-obesity medications to help with weight loss, or if there's an indication for it, even bariatric surgery for those that have uh, excessive weight, uh, amounts of weight to lose or have an indication for bariatric surgery such as um, multiple complications of metabolic syndrome or the presence of diabetes. But then I think um, the, the importance is really 
modifying the risks uh, that are associated with cardiovascular disease. Because interestingly, these same risks are the risks that also um, contribute to the progression and acquisition of fatty liver disease. So we strive to control blood sugar and control blood pressure and even manage um, uh, cholesterol and lipids effectively. Because ultimately, when you take a, a look at all comers with fatty liver disease, the primary cause of death in our patients still remains cardiovascular disease. So we modify uh, the risks of heart disease. And then we really drill down to uh, take, assessing where somebody is in their disease progression and thinking about targeting uh, the liver and liver treatments for any given patients. And the, the medications that are currently written into the guidelines include vitamin E, uh, which I'll talk about shortly, and um, uh, bioglitazone, which is an oral medication uh, approved for the treatment of diabetes. Can we go on? So to put this in perspective, you know, weight loss, if, you're, if you have fatty liver disease, you've heard uh, from your, your family physicians or your primary care doc docs is essential. Um, and, and interestingly, it doesn't take much weight because if one loses as little as three to 5% of their weight, we can get an improvement in the insulin resistance and even uh, start seeing resolution of fatty liver and even NASH, but thresholds of weight loss that exceed seven to 10% have been shown consistently to not only resolve simple fat in the liver, but start to improve, uh, if not resolve, what really matters, which is the inflammation, the injury, the NASH in the liver, and up to 45% of people who lose 10% uh, weight loss or more, as Wayne uh, showed you in, in his success, uh, can have an improvement in fibrosis, which is really what matters for our patients, is to reverse chronic liver injury that can result in um, complications. Next slide, please. So what about bariatric surgery? For some patients, bariatric surgery may need consideration because they, uh, they have um, ex excess amounts of weight to lose, 50 to 100 pounds overweight or complications of metabolic syndrome. And weight loss uh, surgery has been shown not only to decrease risk of cardiovascular disease, but even also stroke and has been demonstrated to um, resolve fatty liver disease, improve NASH, and even result in improvement in hepatic fibrosis. The unfortunate challenge is there is a risk for weight regain after two years if patients can't achieve the necessary lifestyle modifications, not only to lose the weight, but keep it off, which is important both with lifestyle and even considerations of bariatric surgery. Next slide, please. So what do our guidelines say? Well, you know, metformin is a uh, widely used oral medication for the treatment of diabetes and insulin resistance. And I, I do advocate for its use if there's an indication uh, for, for using metformin. Just recognize it hasn't been demonstrated to uh, work against NASH in and of itself. Um, another compound that has been um, uh, evaluated for the treatment of NASH is, is something called glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is a gut-derived hormone. Everybody makes this hormone. And this hormone actually works uh, on multiple different organs, uh, including the pancreas, and it helps regulate weight. It helps improve blood sugar, and it's, it helps maintain um, uh, uh, appropriate balance of our metabolism. And it turns out it, in obesity and diabetes, this hormone is a little lacking. So if it's supplemented, it may actually help with weight loss and improve diabetes. And it has been studied in, in uh, the treatment of NAPLD and NASH with early evidence of success, but currently it's, it's still premature and is not yet written into the guidances to be used as a treatment for NASH. Um, but you may hear discussions with your physicians about GLP-1 receptor agonists for the treatment of obesity and diabetes. Pioglitazone and vitamin E have been studied for the treatment of NASH by a large NIH uh, consortia, funded consortia, and pioglitazone, uh, which is an oral pill for the treatment of diabetes, uh, does improve NASH and can be used in patients with or without diabetes. Um, but the, the study was done uh, in patients with biopsy-proven NASH. 
um, and is not currently advocated for, for use in patients with simple steatosis. We'd recommend diet and exercise uh, uh, for patients with simple steatosis. And also vitamin E has been studied for patients with NASH and is currently recommended for patients without diabetes who do not have cirrhosis. So uh, patients should discuss uh, pioglitazone and vitamin E with their medical providers, but safety is also a consideration to consider. Next slide, please. So um, some concerns about long-term use of high-dose vitamin E has uh, been some controversial data about the risk of um, uh, increased risk for all-cause mortality and potentially the increased risk for bleeding complications such as hemorrhagic stroke um, and the increased risk of, of prostate cancer. Now, pioglitazone can be associated with a uh, slight fluid retention or uh, weight gain, so it's it's not favored in patients who are trying to lose weight, um, but low-dose uh, pioglitazone may be considered. It has been associated with risk of bone thinning or osteoporosis and a questionable risk about um, bladder cancer, but ultimately a personalized approach to caring for our patients is necessary and a, an appropriate uh, discussion with your physicians about the risk benefit of any of these therapies um, uh, should, should be embarked upon. Next slide, please. So vitamin E has recently been demonstrated uh, to not only uh, decrease the uh, risk for needing a liver transplant, but also decrease the risk of what we call hepatic decompensation in patients with cirrhosis. And the blue line there demonstrates patients um, who were on vitamin E and the yellow line, uh, patients who were not taking vitamin E. And the dose that was studied was 800 international units a day. And as you can see from this, what we call Kaplan-Meier curve, there is an improvement in uh, transplant free survival and an, a decreased risk of hepatic decompensation in patients who are on vitamin E. Next slide, please. So this GLP receptor agonist um, in, in, in inducing weight loss has been evaluated and not only does it decrease cardiovascular risk, but as you can see in this right-hand panel, that resolution of uh, NASH is accomplished more frequently, 39% versus 9% in patients who were taking a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and this drug was also called a liraglutide. Um, other stud drugs that have been studied are semaglutide or exenatide. And these, uh, this class of drugs has been demonstrated to improve inflammation, resolution of NASH, and even improve uh, potentially hepatic fibrosis compared to those that were on placebo. Next slide, please. So many, many drugs are being studied for the treatment of NAFLDA NASH, um, and we can consider them in, in three categories, those that help with metabolism, those that help with inflammation or um, cell death, and those that actually target fibrosis. And um, as you can see here, there are several drugs currently in phase three clinical trials. Um, and sadly, unfortunately, some drugs that showed promise initially that didn't work. So I can't emphasize the importance of um, propelling this research forward in hopes that maybe we can um, get a safe and effective um, drug to market for the many uh, patients who are currently affected with, with NASH and fibrosis. Next slide, please. There is uncertainty about the best target for NASH. Uh, and fortunately, we have a very robust pipeline of drugs that are just currently in, in uh, all phases of clinical trials. And one drug that is currently in review uh, by the FDA called the Bitticolic Acid. Next drug, please. And so what has the impact of COVID had on our patients? Well, uh, I have been seeing many patients through COVID and I think the sedentary lifestyle has certainly affected many of them. There's a propensity to eat more and not exercise as much. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of getting up and getting going and, and, and uh, trying to optimize diets. Uh, the ultimate goal, of course, is to improve the risk factors for, for NAFLD and, and metabolic syndrome and, and obesity. And I want to emphasize that severe liver disease, while it doesn't increase your risk of acquiring COVID-19, uh, certainly can be associated with increased complications if one is to acquire COVID-19. Um, there is um, some data that treating um, 
uh, hypertension, although there's no evidence that angiotensin receptor agonists increase the risk of COVID, but even managing diabetes and hypertension can decrease uh, severe complications uh, or death from COVID. Um, but any patients who have fatty liver disease and particularly those who have cirrhosis, um, early admission and attention to medical care is, is always warranted if you're concerned about um, exposure or acquisition of COVID-19. Next. So the take home messages, there's clearly a critical need for safe and effective treatments against fibrosis. Um, since the pathogenesis uh, of, of fatty liver disease and particularly NASH is complex, there are many different pathways um, involved. We really do need uh, to consider future combination therapies. And ultimately, I think what's most important uh, is there are different approaches um, uh, and there's no one size fits all and patients need to be evaluated in a unique tailored approach to your particular subtype and your particular stage of fatty liver disease needs to be considered in your treatment algorithms. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Malik, that was excellent. Um, you know, I, I, I love that diagram uh, with, uh, with the targets, uh, looking at the uncertainty about the best targets for NASH and the metabolic, apoptotic, inflammatory, and fibrotic. And, and it's interesting to look at those on a trajectory of severity or disease progression. And at different phases, um, uh, there may be a need for different types of interventions. And so it's about stacking interventions as well as having different interventions at the same time. Uh, I also really appreciate the comment about customization of the therapy uh, per patient and what their risk factors might be and what stage they might be in. Um, but based on the data um, and the studies and the therapeutic responses, do you think we have a clear line that we should draw between diabetic patients and non-diabetic patients with the other risk factors being equal? Um, uh, and, and should we start thinking about it in those terms? Well, you know, I, I see this as a continuum. Um, so this is not uh, about the presence or absence per se of diabetes. Obesity is a risk factor for acquisition of diabetes and NASH is a risk factor for acquisition of diabetes. And if you really challenge a patient who has NAFLD and NASH, uh, with glucose tolerance tests, you may actually uncover diabetes, even though they don't have a labeled diagnosis of such as a man. So I see this as a continuum. And there is data to suggest that if we take patients who have diabetes and improve the diabetes, uh, we can decrease uh, risk for, for um, progression. Um, and certainly the data with regards to treatment of diabetes with some of the anti-diabetic medications suggests that improving insulin resistance improves diabetes. So I see this as a continuum, not as, a, um, as, as two different buckets of disease. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Sanyal, any comments on that? Oh, you're on mute. Just trying to avoid uh, echo. Uh, no, I fully agree with uh, everything Manal just said. And uh, I, I think uh, when you start with treating the root cause, some things, I'm, can I add a couple of things on, layer them on top of what Manal said? Absolutely. Uh, so not to disagree, but to add on to, and that is, you know, we often pay lip service to lifestyle change. We say, oh, you got to get up, you got to exercise, you got to eat less. Very easy to say. But when you are metabolically challenged, you have lifestyle issues. We never, we have not spent enough time talking about why it is that somebody cannot engage in and maintain that lifestyle change. If we figured this out, this whole issue of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, variety of cancers, NASH, Alzheimer's, all would CKD would suddenly drop by half. Mm -hmm. And it's so obvious, and yet there is so little emphasis on trying to understand the, physio the, the reasons why people cannot. So I think we have to look at social issues. We have to look at economic issues. We have to look at work life. We have to look at sleep. We have to look at 
why people eat the way they do. You know, what are the, some people, you know, there's this whole emerging literature that after bariatrics, the risk of suicide goes up. And we think it's because many people eat as a coping mechanism. And when they are unable to eat in the absence of a viable coping me mechanism, you set them up to be tipped over in terms of depression or whatever it is that's driving their behavior. So I think developing, I think we really need more time and energy devoted to understanding that there needs to be more research around the potential benefits of mindfulness, for example. There are actually already a body of science and literature around mindfulness and uh, uh, impacting metabolic syndrome. And if you have beneficial effects on metabolic syndrome, I'd be surprised if it did not also have beneficial effects on fatty liver disease. So I think this is a yet untapped area of work within the fatty liver disease field. And yeah. you know, it doesn't cost too much to actually implement these once you figure out what works. And we clearly need to understand the barriers uh, for our patients. And 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 maybe it, it, it we're, nobody needs to turn into a major marathon runner, but certain certain physical activities may serve some uh, better than others. Maybe non weight bearing exercise, pool exercises, even walking. Um, but we we have to address this because the data would suggest that effective lifestyle modification, even potentially. Uh, without a, uh, a substantial amount of weight can improve NAFL to NASH as much as maybe some of the therapeutics that are currently being evaluated. So we, we, we need to address this in a serious way such that we can help our patients become effective in achieving these goals. Um, while, while therapies are, are promising, it's certainly, um, it, it shouldn't come in lieu of, of uh, healthier lifestyles. Um, uh, excellent. And <laughs> you speaking my language now as a public health physician, it's so important for us to view patients in their social and environmental context um, uh, to understand how they will uh, take up these particular interventions. Okay. Um, so we're really um, delighted that Dr. Emery Danani can join us um, today and she'll focus on lifestyle and dietary considerations for people living with NAFLD. Uh, Dr. Tanani is the Assistant Professor of Medicine in Division of Liver Diseases at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York. So I'm going to turn this over to you, Dr. Tanani, and then hopefully, um, you know, time permits, we will uh, go into a Q&A session. Great, thanks so much. So these are my disclosures. We'll keep going. So I first just want to thank Wayne and the Fatty Liver uh, Foundation for the invitation to speak to you about lifestyle um, changes or, um, you know, recommendations for people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, so I thought we would just start off first by um, kind of reviewing what our um, society guidelines tell us in terms of, you know, lifestyle when it comes to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And one of the most important things that, you know, I try to stress and also the guideline stress is reducing calories is probably the most important uh, part of lifestyle. Um, we do know that um, telling patients specifically um, what weight loss means and the degree of weight loss and how it correlates with improvement in your liver disease um, is important. So we do have evidence that shows that if you lose anywhere between seven to 10% of your total body weight, you will improve not just liver fat and inflammation, but you will also um, have a high chance of improving uh, the fibrosis, which is the um, which is the scarring feature that we see in, um, in, in this type of liver disease. Um, we, you know, our, my, one of my colleagues is going to go into some of the treatments, uh, but one of the things, again, to really stress here is that lifestyle, despite what medications you take, despite what other additive things that we do, um, really lifestyle becomes the backbone of treatment. 
Um, one of the other things to think about also is um, diets. And we're going to go into this in the next couple of slides. But by the time I see somebody, I'm always asked lots of questions about, you know, which is the best diet that I need to go on? How long do I need to go on a diet for? Um, but honestly, we actually do not have any great clinical trials that look at um, specific diets in fatty liver disease. We, um, and that's for a multitude of reasons. Um, so really the focus is calorie restriction and weight loss. Next slide, please. So when we talk about healthy lifestyle, we really kind of want to focus on diet. Um, and, I, and I use diet very loosely here. So diet would really mean um, weight loss or some form of healthy eating, um, exercise, um, and then all the other things um, that we think about in terms of lifestyle. So here you should also think about uh, things like smoking cessation, but also if there's any other medications that you're taking that could be contributing to your disease. Um, and also the other thing about lifestyle to think about um, is also alcohol intake. When we think about interventions, uh, we are talking about diet, exercise, and lifestyle here, but you have to think about some of the pharmacological interventions. So really the ones that we have approved today are some of the um, obesity medications. And we have when we do know that you can lose about eight to ten percent of your weight um, with some of the pharmacological interventions. Um, the only caveat to that is that typically people will need long-term treatment. The other intervention uh, that's a surgical intervention is bariatric surgery. Uh, bariatric surgery um, is typically um, recommended for people who have obesity or have um, obesity with other signs of metabolic syndrome. But we also have studies to show that bariatric surgery not, is effective in losing 10 to 30% of your weight, but also can improve the features of fatty liver disease, steatohepatitis, which is the inflammation associated with fatty liver disease and also fibrosis. Um, bottom line is um, the the most important thing is the weight loss that we achieve with, you know, all these different modalities that correlates with improvement of fatty liver disease. Next slide, please. So this is a, this I think is a really important slide because um, it highlights um, the, it highlights some of the, some of the many, many diets out there um, for weight loss. Um, so like I mentioned, by the time I see patients for uh, fatty liver disease, um, they've usually started, patients have typically um, tried multiple diets with um, some, some positive re results, but typically what happens is they lose the weight initially and then they yo-yo back up to the original weight. And so there's a lot of frustration by the time um, I see them. And the, one of the questions I always get asked is, you know, which diet should I go on? Um, there's different strategies that, you know, a lot of these diets have, um, majority of them really, um, focus on some of the macronutrient, uh, components. So, you know, either they're, um, high protein diets with low carbohydrates or, you know, low fat diets with low, low carbohydrate, um, diets. Uh, what's become pretty popular, uh, these days is intermittent fasting. So this is prolonged times of fasting, um, and there's different ways to do it, uh, and then there's also um, other types of diets where we're actually restricting food groups. So a lot of people uh, will try gluten-free diets or a paleo diet. But the bottom line, again, for all these um, diets that are out there is we are essentially um, um, de decreasing calorie intake. That's the purpose to try to decrease calorie intake. You want to create a negative balance, which basically means the amount that you put in should be less than the amount that you, you put out. So through exertion or exercise, and you really want to try focus on high quality foods. So real foods versus processed foods. And then the biggest thing with these diets, and I think the reason why we don't have much success with them is that they have to be sustainable. Can we adhere to this diet long-term? And majority of the time, I'm unfortunately, these diets are not palatable or not realistic as a long-term as a long-term intervention. Next slide, please. So, so if someone is really, um, you know, adamant that they want to try a diet, in terms of um, diets and inter uh, diets for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the Mediterranean 
uh, diet is by far the one that's been studied the most and also has been recommended by our society guidelines, the um, ASLD guidelines. Um, so what, I'm show what we're showing here in this graph is a study, a six month observational study of um, the Mediterranean diet um, in addition to monthly nutritional counseling that patients received uh, who had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there were 46 patients in this in this study. And at six months, what they found was that a majority of these patients, about 80% of these patients had an improvement in their fat, liver fat. And actually one out of five, so 20% of the patients had complete dissolution or complete um, improvement in their fat. Um, again, like this study that we're illustrating here and other studies, um, there are some drawbacks and one of them is it's a short study. Um, so it's only a six month study. Um, the question really becomes, is it something that is sustainable? Um, the other things that we really want to look at when we think about some of these dietary in interventions is not only was it, what, what is it doing to liver fat, but what we really want to see is, is it doing something to liver inflammation? And in the long term, is it doing something to liver scarring or liver fibrosis? Because we do know that liver fibrosis um, or liver scarring it correlates with all cause mortality and liver related mortality. So as much as we want to see the improvement in liver fat, what we really want to see is do dietary interventions work for improvement in liver steatohepatitis, which is liver inflammation and liver fibrosis. Um, next slide, please. So again, uh, what's the evidence uh, with, for NAFLD? Um, there are some other popular diets, which I actually think are pretty good. Um, so for instance, the um, DASH diet, which is a uh, diet um, that is um, high in vegetables, fruits, and low fat dairy foods. Um, and they also focus on moderate amounts of whole grains, fish, poultry, and nuts. Um, while there are lots of diets out there, such as the Weight Watchers program and the Jenny Craig, which is probably some of the longest um, um, diets that are out there in terms of um, success at weight loss, we actually do not have any data in terms of what they do for NAFLD. Um, and really, um, what I what I want to stress here is that, that that whatever diet or intervention that you decide to adopt, you want to make sure that it's sustainable um, and it's something that's realistic long term. Next slide, please. So what's the, you know, what's the, what's the uh, conclusion of popular diets in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Um, in general, the Mediterranean diet, if it's palatable uh, to you, um, it's a good choice um, as it's a good balance between, um, you know, fruits, grains, and vegetables, eating lean meats, and uh, moderate amounts of uh, dairy intake, and using healthy fats such as avocados and olive oils. Um, the more restrictive diets can work in the short term, like we've, uh, like, you know, like I've um, discussed, but the problem really is adherence, and it's difficult to follow long term. Essentially, when you think about a diet, you want to think about it in terms of calorie restriction and that essentially is what drives the weight loss um, and that's what then improves uh, fatty liver disease. Um, just a note here is when you when I see people in the clinic I typically do not use the word diet at all and what I try to do is really help patients tailor what they typically eat on the regular day in a more healthy fashion. Um, I try to take out the stigma that diets usually have. So really the focus should be on a healthy diet, ideally manipulating what you typically eat in a more healthier fashion. Uh, next slide, please. Another important aspect of uh, lifestyle intervention is um, and uh, that you could potentially do is um, vitamins or taking additional supplements. And this is a question that I guess often are there any vitamins or supplements that you would advise are uh, for people with fatty liver disease so in general when we think about the liver the liver has lots of functions but one of the things that it also does it transports and stores many micronutrients and in general we know just in chronic liver disease as well as in fatty liver disease uh, patients typically have low blood levels of zinc 
copper, vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E. And this is really, um, these are the fat soluble vitamins, the A, D, and E, and they're usually, um, you know, uh, formed and processed in the liver. Um, we do know that there's low levels of these micronutrients and it can be associated with NAFLD severity, so the more advanced disease that you have, um, but we don't truly understand the mechanisms of uh, why that happens. In terms of vitamin supplementation, um, the thought is that vitamin supplements um, can um, be uh, have antioxidant qualities and maybe even anti fibrotic uh, qualities that would actually uh, protect the liver and also help with the fibrosis. Um, one of my colleagues uh, is going to be going into some of the studies that we have with vitamin E, um, but in general, uh, we do not recommend vitamin supplementation uh, to um, our patients with an non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, we will discuss this in the next slide, um, but vitamin E can be recommended in certain populations um, but again, the impact of vitamin E, again, has been shown to improve liver fat. Um, uh, it has not shown an impact on liver fibrosis or liver scarring, and then essentially has not shown an impact on mortality. So long-term, we don't know the long-term effects of vitamin E supplementation in people with fatty liver disease. Next slide, please. So what is our recommendation? Vitamin E can be recommended in patients who, who are non-diabetic uh, with NASH. So again, NASH is the form of fatty liver disease that's associated with the inflammation. So it stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Um, again, you want to have a very um, individualized conversation with each patient that you consider vitamin E for because there are some risks and, and benefits. So you have to make sure that that's actually uh, use vitamin E. Vitamin D replacement theoretically does make sense because it is a fat soluble vitamin and we do know that with more advanced disease we will see vitamin D deficiency in people with chronic liver disease but also with fatty liver disease. Um, so I, my general rule is if you truly have evidence of vitamin D deficiency, for instance on a blood test, then you should supplement it because you you need to supplement it, but it doesn't necessarily um, necessarily work for fatty liver disease in, in particular. So again, no specific dietary intervention has evidence that's superior except for calorie restriction, like I've mentioned before. Um, again, the key thing here, here is whatever lifestyle modification that you make, you wanna make sure that it's sustainable um, and something that's practical. Next slide, please. So in general, um, when you come and see the clinic, and I think a lot of hepatologists, when you come and see them in the clinic about um, uh, fatty liver disease, one of the biggest discussions around this is lifestyle changes, um, specifically about your relationship with food and how you manage um, how you manage food um, becomes vital and very important uh, part, part of the conversation when you discuss this with your clinician. So uh, like I said, I, I shy away from using the word diet and I really focus on healthy eating. Um, if the Mediterranean diet is palatable, um, so uh, and if it's something that people find that they can do realistically, then I do uh, present them that that's the one that we have the most evidence for and that's something to focus on. The other one thing that I do is I, I, I tell them, I tell patients to focus on the my plate approach. So if you think about a, if you think about a plate, you want to think about about half of that plate being full of, of um, vegetables and grains, fruit, vegetable and grains. Um, you want to then think about a quarter of it being protein and then the last quarter of it uh, being a starch. So whether it be something like a rice or a potato um, or, a, you know, a pasta or a bread. So you really want to focus in on it's the fibers and the grains that will keep you full. Will, uh, that will keep you full longer, um, and you want the protein in there as well to supplement that. And you I, I, um, have patients. Uh, people do less of the simple starches, um, um, like the you know the breads, the the, the breads, uh, the rice, um, and pastas. Um, another really important part is I do an exercise on portion control. So we all have, we all think we have an idea of what a one portion or what serving size is. Um, so we do, sp I do spend a lot of time uh, talking about portion control and 
you know, what do we consider a portion? Um, so that's something to be mindful of. The other, um, the other great thing you can uh, start doing is also once you put food on your plate, you shouldn't be going for seconds. And another uh, great approach is also when you go out to eat at restaurants, think about splitting your meals or um, asking for healthy substitutions to some of the simple carbs, asking for an extra portion of vegetables vegetables instead of, you know, all the rice um, maybe serving with that meal. Um, another big part of this is um, avoiding fast foods. Those are usually very calorie dense foods uh, with lots of fillers, usually processed foods. Um, so you really want to try to avoid fast foods or limited. Um, and also you want to try and limit some, you know, nighttime, like after dinner snacking, um, because that would, you know, that's just extra calories that you don't necessarily need. Um, another big aspect, another big aspect of healthy lifestyle that I focus on is eliminating um, sugar sweetened beverages or high fructose corn syrup. Um, so what I encourage everyone to really do is turn their labels around whatever packaging they're buying, turn it around and actually look to see how much um, added sugar is in, in, in the food that you're eating. Um, so I, you know, we go through labels very um, in detail to just empower patients how to make smarter choices when it comes to um, prepackaged foods. Uh, next uh, slide, please. I wanted to highlight, um, you know, this, 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 this may look like very complicated graphs, but I did want to highlight something about sugar that's really, really important uh, when it comes to NAFLD, is specifically how harmful sugar can be to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And here what I'm really talking about is added sugar, um, you know, high fructose corn syrup, uh, things that we find in our uh, sweetened beverages, for instance. So what you're seeing on the left of the slide is um, data from the NHANES um, database, which basically shows the incidence of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as it correlates to obesity and added and sugar consumption. And you can see very nicely that as time has gone by uh, from 1988, as our obesity rates, as our sugar, as our, in, as our sugar sweetened beverages have increased, um, the obesity rates have increased as well, and with that fatty liver disease. What I'm showing and illustrating on the right side is basically a review, um, what we describe as a systematic review uh, meta-analysis of um, multiple studies that looked at the uh, impact of sugar-sweetened beverages on the incidence of fatty liver disease. And you can see here, um, and what you really wanna look at is the, the, the black diamond on the, the bottom of that graph. And you can see here that sugar sweetened beverages basically increases your relative risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease by 39%. So the take home here really is sugar, specifically fructose for specifically added sugars, um, high high fructose corn syrup can be detrimental to the liver um, and again closely correlates with the, the obesity epidemic um, that we're in right now. Next slide please. So I wanted to um, switch gears a little bit um, in terms of you know how can we um, achieve some of these lifestyle changes. So it's very easy to just tell someone like uh, when we see people in the clinic and say, hey, you know, the best treatment we have at this time is, you know, lose some weight, try target seven to 10% of your total body weight, and we'll see you later. And typically, that approach doesn't work. Um, and so what that made me, what that made me do and my group do is, you know, explore, are there any ways um, or is there any evidence out there or is there any data out there that would help us achieve some of these weight loss goals that we're asking our patients to adopt? So I went to the diabetes prevention program. So for those of you who don't know much about it, it's a, um, it's, it's a program called the DPP, uh, which is um, um, available in the United States for people with prediabetes to prevent um, to prevent the development of uh, diabetes. Um, so here, this is these are some of the results from the original um, trials that were done uh, in this in this study. Um, so it's 
this trial that looked at evidence-based intervention targeted to individuals with prediabetes, and their real goal was to look at weight loss and behavior change, so our behavior around food. What they did was they took patients with prediabetes and, and uh, randomized them to three arms, so the placebo arm where they just tell them, hey, a, you know, lose some weight and change change the way you eat. Uh, the second arm was the metf uh, a metformin arm. So metformin is one of our medications, one of our first line medications that we use for the treatment of diabetes. And then the third arm was this, um, this program, which we will call the lifestyle program. And what they found at the end of follow-up, which um, uh, was uh, on average about 2.8 years, almost three years, the diabetes prevention program reduced new cases of type 2 diabetes in 58%, and the most impact was seen um, in, the, in the population um, of 60 years and higher, uh, 71%. Um, so I looked at this program and I said, hey, this sounds like a pretty great program. Why can't we do something like this um, with, the, with the population of fatty liver disease, specifically because there's such a close relationship between fatty liver disease and prediabetes and diabetes? Um, next slide, please. So what we then did was we used, we adapted the DPP program um, and ran the program for a full year. But what we did was we adapted it so it worked for patients with fatty liver disease. So our target population here was fatty liver disease versus people with prediabetes. And here just um, summarizes for you how we ran the program. It literally is the same program, but the only difference is here there was a lifestyle coach involved uh, with a physician and it was a group um, and it was done in one group setting. Um, we did weigh-ins for every patient at every course session and there was communication with the research team or the lifestyle coach and the physician and the and the group itself. And we want, one we wanted to see, was this program feasible? Can we do something like this in people? with fatty liver disease. So the primary endpoint was retention, um, uh, retention rates. And then the secondary endpoints were, of course, looking to see what the impact of this program was on people with fatty liver disease, specifically liver fat, and what did it do to other medical problems that these patients typically have, such as diabetes, prediabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, for instance. Um, next slide, please. So here, this is a summary of the results. Sorry that it's uh, in so small, but I'll, I've tried to highlight just some of the key findings of this program. Um, so there were 14 patients who were included in the study, in the one-year study. And you can see here highlighted in um, red in the first bar, uh, first um, row, is that there was a significant change uh, noted from baseline mean weight to six months and then one year. Um, the um, third row, which is highlighted in yellow, that is something called the CAP score. The CAP score is something that tells us how much fat you have in the uh, liver or hepatic steatosis. And you can see here that over time, or from, from baseline to six months and then one year, there was also an improvement in liver fat uh, seen. Out of the 14 patients that were enrolled, um, 11 patients completed the program. Um, so there was a 79% retention rate for this program. Next. Uh, uh, next slide or click. So, so again, like I said, there was 79% retention rate at 12 months. And really at the end of 12 months, we did see a significant uh, weight loss. Um, there was also an improvement in liver tests. Um, and we also were able to show some improvement in metabolic parameters. Um, and this was noted through improvements in cholesterol profiles and hemoglobin A1C, which is one of the blood tests that we use uh, for people with prediabetes and diabetes. Um, again, this limitation of such a study is uh, similar to other studies is that it was a small study and only included 14 patients. Um, and other things that would have been interesting to look at is uh, quality of life measures, like how, how did it really impact um, uh, life? Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dinani. That's really excellent and for giving us a, a very nice overview of all the evidence on different dietary approaches and, and congratulations on, on the pilot uh, DPP program that you show with us. Um, I just want to take the next um, perhaps couple minutes to uh, raise some of the questions that we just received from uh, our audience. You touch on this already, Dr. Dinani. This is a question that, that comes up quite often uh, that we hear at the foundation. This also comes from a NASH patient. 
and she wants to find out, uh, you know, that she finds it necessary to eat some of her favorite foods, um, in this case, lasagna, three to four times a year. Um, is there anything that, that she could do to mitigate eating bad foods, either before or after eating the bad foods? Uh, that, I, think, I, think that's a, I think that's a great question. And I chuckle because, you know, because again, I've, I've been asked this similar question before. Um, so I think to indulge once in a while is fine. Um, I could give you lots of personal stories about this, um, but indulgence is fine. It's human nature. It's normal. Um, so one of the things you want to do when you embrace a healthy lifestyle is you don't want to be depriving yourself of all the things that are pleasurable. So my general advice is it's okay to have lasagna three times a year if you, you if you want to. It's just about eating lasagna every day. Um, so for instance, um, you know, with the hol when holidays come around, it's okay to enjoy uh, big holiday meals uh, with your families, but you just want to make sure you're not doing that on a on a on a regular basis. And this kind of goes back to um, the sustainability um, and the long term benefit benefits of adopting a, le uh, a healthy lifestyle. And that's why I shy away from using the word diet or adopting a very specific diet that may not be uh, practical to your lifestyle. So that's my long-winded answer to that. So basically, yes, have lasagna three times a year if you want to, uh, but just don't do it every day. So um, we will open up to, to uh, questions um, uh, from from uh, our attendees, uh, but let me kick off with this question uh, to uh, uh, our doctors on the panel. So as we've talked about this, we, we're starting to, and uh, the two of you brought up these points of this very holistic, multidisciplinary approach. So what would you think a team of people taking care of someone with Nash or Naffold should look like. It's, it's certainly not the job of only a hepatologist or a primary care physician. And if we have to think about this as a team approach, what would that team look like? Maybe I can jump in first because I actually have to go see a patient. Mm -hmm. Clinic starting at one. So if we were a few minutes into the clinic. Uh, I, I think eventually the home for the patient is with the primary care physician for most patients. And it's important for primary care physicians to look at something as simple as a Fib4, which they should all be able to do. And if it is more than 1.3, it's a little bit of an orange flag at least. And if it's more than 2.6, that for sure is the patient that should go on to a hepatologist to be seen. And that way you don't flood the hepatologist's office with patients who have a little bit of fat in their liver and at the same time, you're not referring every patient in your clinic on to see a subspecialist. So because the, with a FIB4 over 2.67, your pretest probability of having something significant increases quite substantially. And then, you know, we really need to think about FIB4 as a continuum rather than these both artificial thresholds that are forced upon us by reviewers of journals. And then they become part of the, you know, established truths. A 2.65 is not 2.67, but I would challenge any physician to tell me they can tell with any confidence that patient's risk profile is different than someone with a FIB4 of 2.69, for example. So it's really a continuum and a, getting a sense of probability of having something significant. So you make that decision based on the comorbidity profile and the probability that there's significant liver disease. Then you go to see a liver doctor. But for the most part, for the bulk of the patients, they belong in primary care because the root cause treatment has is directly linked to the treatment of their obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, heart disease, cancer screening, osteoarthritis, low back pain, all those kind of things. So that's my sort of take on, you know, how the majority of these patients should be managed and restricting the use of the hepatologist for those with a FIB4 over 
I, I fully agree. I think the hepatologists need to be seeing those patients who are highest risk with more advanced hepatic fibrosis and cirrhosis. Um, and the majority of patients um, will be well managed in primary care and, and see other specialists as need necessitates, whether it's for diabetes or nutrition, cardiovascular symptoms. Um, but um, I agree fully with Dr. Sanyo. Um, uh, I might, might just step in here for a minute. Um, you know, we we face this as patients all the time. And one of the tremendous challenges we have is that primary care docs are not yet well trained about uh, liver disease and its advancement. And, you know, fatty liver is kind of viewed as a as not something that you worry about, uh, not something that you talk about. And uh, it's, you know, we have uh, you super experts here because we're looking at the research end of the, of the field and uh, we can spend a long time talking about uh, the need for development in the primary care area. And I absolutely agree with you, you know, the, uh, we can't overload the hepatologists, but we must find ways to uh, engage the primary care world as, as uh, being more proactive about uh, identifying people. And I, uh, one of the things I wanted to comment on, and I was, it's too bad that Dr. Sanyal uh, had to leave because yeah, one of the things that first got me involved with the Mediterranean diet and our approach to how the Fatty Liver Foundation manages diet is that he did a, he was a co-author in a 2007 study by uh, Dr. Vukovic, uh, where they studied various diets, which were popular at the time. And the only one that showed a decrease in steatosis was the Mediterranean diet. And that, because of his involvement, you know, I've kind of followed Dr. Sanyal as he's my, one of my heroes because he led me into a successful management of my disease because the Fatty Liver Foundation is fundamentally based on a, a, uh, an, an advanced uh, Mediterranean diet, if you will, because we focus very much on uh, extra virgin olive oil and unsaturated fats. Uh, and I encourage anybody that uh, is interested in that side of things to visit our website. So I just had to step in there for a minute. And, and on that note, Wayne, I, I couldn't agree more. We are we are making strides. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like it's fast enough, um, but we are making strides with education, uh, both with primary care and non, non liver uh, related specialists. And awareness of this disease, disease entity, is readily and rapidly increasing. Five years ago, primary care doctors said, We don't see this. We don't understand this. Now, at least I'm hearing from them, Okay, I see a lot of this. How, how do I risk stratify? So um, progress is being made in education. It sometimes doesn't feel like it's fast enough when you're the patient. Um, and, uh, and we need more foundations and more invested people to, to do what you're doing, get the message out, get the awareness out, um, uh, talk it and, 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 and scientists being presenting at not only their specialty disciplines, but uh, primary care uh, arenas to heighten heighten education. Um, uh, that's excellent, and I will say from the Fatty Liver Foundation, and our uh, approach is from the bottom up, so it's from the patient perspective. Um, and and when we we think about primary care, we all you know everyone's automatic re re reaction is the primary care physician. And yet the primary care at the community level is community health workers, is nutritionists, it's dietitians, it's life coaches, etc. And to that end, uh, a program that we're working on, it's still in development phase uh, at the Fatty Liver Foundation, are patient navigators. How do we work with people in the community to help provide that support so that they can live healthier lifestyles 
eat better, exercise, et cetera, and provide that motivation. Because one of the key things, uh, you know, and, and Wayne had certainly an excellent management team, was the social support that he received to live those lifestyle changes. And that's one of our missions at the Fatty Liver Foundation, to create that enabling environment at the community level for the patient. Uh, Wayne, we have a minute left. Would, would you like to wrap up and uh, give your final uh, comments? Yes, that's, uh, it's, uh, I wish uh, Dr. Danani had been able to join us, but this has been excellent. And I, I certainly appreciate uh, you joining uh, join us, Dr. Alpamonic, and, uh, and Dr. Sunyal uh, as well. I'll touch base with him uh, separately. But <clears throat> it is so important for the, the patient community to understand the progress that is being made. And one of the things that uh, we also want to tell or want patients to understand is how vital it is that they participate in these clinical trials because we can't get the therapies that we need if we can't get people enrolled in, physical, in, in, in the clinical trials. And so a major part of our mission in all of this outreach is to um, have people be aware of the research, about the progress, about the breadth of the field. And the slide that you showed about all of the uh, different uh, trials going on, you know, is very impressive, but we, we can't do all those trials if patients don't come forward and participate as uh, participants uh, in the clinical trial process. So uh, that's just a particularly uh, vital message that we want to pass along. Um, we will be uh, doing uh, another uh, webinar following the AASLD meeting. And uh, I think we're going to get a slide here about that. But <clears throat> I'm particularly uh, pleased by this because, uh, you know, Dr. Chung in particular is the incoming uh, C uh, president of the AASLD. Um, so it's quite... Uh, I'm very honored because he has so many demands on his time and the fact that uh, he's going to join our webinar along with uh, Dr. Bonzal is, is, is really great and, and Megan Gray is one of my great favorite uh, nutritionist uh, people. So we're looking forward to the AASLD uh, webinar because I think that um, that's going to be a highlight of the year. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing in these conferences is, is uh, the differences between them. The Paris conference, which we're just uh, doing now, is very intimate, very uh, focused on the researchers and the, the details of, of uh, this process of, of discovery. The AASLD is the big brother to all of these. And this is where all of the people that are engaged with liver disease and liver policy and patient uh, uh, advocacy, uh, we all gather in this uh, very large, uh, interaction. And this will be um, even bigger, I suspect, because when you have the, in the physical meetings, we had like 10,000 people trying to get together. And in this virtual platform, I have no idea how many <laughs> we're liable to see. But uh, we're really looking forward to doing our retrospective on that program. So I invite you all to uh, stay tuned and uh, join us uh, at that time. Thank, Thank you, you, Wayne. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdul Malek and our other panelists and uh, for all of you for attending. Take care.